Welcome to the Grit.org podcast with Colby Harris and Brian Harbin. In these episodes, they speak to top achievers in athletics and business to understand the habits and mindset they apply in order to build more grit. Welcome back to the Grit.org podcast. My name is Colby Harris. Alongside me is the Grit Man himself, Brian Harbin, and we are here with today's guest, Ely Liao Warren. Ely, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today. Well, it's always fun to get someone in that we have a, a prior friendship with that we've known. We met Ely last year through the Toastmasters group here in San Marco, Jacksonville. Uh, her and her husband, Bob, have just been awesome, very pivotal and impactful within what we do here at Grit.org, supporters of Grit Camp. So, Ely, thank you again for taking the time to be here. Just go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you do so that people can kind of get an inside look before we keep rolling. Yeah, of course. So, again, my name is Ely, and I have a life coaching organization, a heart centered life coaching organization where I help clients create more balance, more ha- happiness and more fulfillment. Mm. Yeah. And I could use all three of those things every <laughs> all right. day. Come on, come on in. Yeah. You're always welcome. Oh, yeah. This is going to be a fun one. I'm already really excited. It's always a good time when we get someone on that's talking the way you are about like, you know, I help people be happier. It's like, well, all of our listeners could definitely use that. <laughs> um, so go ahead and kick it off, Ely, by telling us a little bit about your upbringing. You're a first generation Taiwanese American born in Georgia and raised in Florida. How do you think that background shaped who you are today? That's a really great question. I think it might be important to go back a little bit, B.E., before Ely. (laughs) My great aunt was the first in our family to move here from Taiwan to Tallahassee. And she opened the first Chinese restaurant in Tallahassee in 1969. (laughs) It got really busy She phoned up my grandma, which is her sister, and she said, hey, can you help? It's getting really busy right now. And my family doesn't really talk about the details to it much. I found this out pretty recently, but I gauge that this opportunity to move from Taiwan to Tallahassee was a a better opportunity and a way to provide for her family, for their family. So my grandmother has four kids at that time. They were between 12 and 19. Could you imagine leaving? She left her kids and her husband to come to the States to work for my great aunt in Tallahassee. Like I mentioned, could you imagine leaving your family, Brian, you have kids to go to another country and not see them, one of them for seven years or eight years and just send money back home. And for you, if your mom left when you were 12 and you didn't see her until you were 19, she went to another country. She she sent you back money here and there every month. It's so, a huge sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, but it it it, did, it made me very it shaped who I was, because who I am, because it made me appreciative for the sacrifices. I don't think because I didn't know a lot of it too, and as a kid, I don't think you're as grateful and appreciative and aware as as you are when you get into adulthood. But it made me appreciative of the sacrifices they made. And my dad moved here in 1982. He started off as a dishwasher for my aunt in Tallahassee and then opened his first restaurant in Valdosta, Georgia, then went to his prime. He at his prime, he had over 10 restaurants, owned over 10 restaurants, and then he was a commissioner or ambassador to Taiwan for Florida. And that's something that's appointed by the Taiwanese president. Mm -hmm. So all of that to, to say that they taught me a lot of grit and they taught, and I'm so appreciative of the sacrifice. And then growing up, it was very different because they were so busy working and providing for us. So we didn't know a lot of the cultural differences between the 
four walls within our home and then outside. As an example, a short example, the tooth fairy. Have you ever heard of the tooth fairy? Once or twice. Okay. <laughs> Apparently he comes, I heard from kids at school. Apparently he comes in and leaves money for the kids under the pillow. And I thought, well, that includes me. I'm a kid. I have a loose tooth. So I tried it one time and I was I was excited when I woke up in the next morning and then I flipped over the the pillow and I'm like, oh, my tooth is still there. <laughs> and I tried it a couple of times and it didn't work. But those things were were very different. And the food that we ate were, was different, right? I, my grandma would cook food to bring to for school because that's her way of showing love. And then everybody would make fun of me for smelling up the cafeteria. <laughs> so, so it's just interesting, right? Like the, the difference is I didn't know why I was being made fun of. I'm like, this is really good food. Kids are so oblivious. <laughs> yeah. <in> the States. <laughs> uh. yeah. But you know, that's, that's how it was kind of growing up. And I was one of two Asians in my high school the other one is this in Valdosta, by the way. This is in Leesburg. Leesburg yeah, I grew okay. up in Leesburg, Florida. It's a small little town there, but the other one was my brother. So there wasn't that much diversity per se, too, in in the town and getting made fun of once in a while for just looking different. And I felt different too. Not only did I look different, but I just felt like I don't know, just a little bit different. But it made me appreciate now. I, I I love gravitating. I felt alone at certain points, and it, it makes me gravitate towards when we're at a party. The the one or two people who are alone and just standing there by themselves, I I am gravitated toward them and talk to them because I I feel like I know how they feel yeah. and, and don't want them to feel alone. You can relate to that discomfort. Yeah. So did you grow up working and you grew up working in the restaurant? Tell us about kind of your experience with that. Yeah. First, I think every child or sorry, every teenager should have to work in the restaurant business. I, I mean, th there's so many benefits to it. Not only does it teach work ethic, and with my family, seeing them day in and day out work so hard. I mean, my dad would literally, I'd see him leave about seven o'clock. Sometimes he dropped me off at school and then he'd come seven, seven in the morning and he wouldn't come back till 11 PM every day. It wasn't just five days a week. I mean, I think we're, we're more in a culture right now of balance and, and, and that's what I work on too, which, which has kind of led to that balance because I've worked, worked a lot, but it taught me work ethic. It taught me customer service, kind of dealing with different personalities. And then it taught me teamwork, but with my, my family watching them, you, have you ever heard the mantra, the quote, work hard, play hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think in immigrants mantra, or at least my family's mantra was work hard, work hard harder. Mm. <laughs> and, and that's, that's what I it, saw. Right? Yeah. Because that's what they knew. And that's, and they were just providing and really trying to provide the best life financially f and providing enough things for our family. Yeah. And I think, you know, conversations like this have been one of the coolest things about being on the podcast is like, I can take these stories to people that are like, you know, in different scenarios where they have so much to be grateful for at yeah. a young age and you yeah. just can't, you don't have that perspective. And I love yeah. sharing stories like this. Like we've had, I think now we just did a, do you know Uncho of Haymaker Coffee in Jacksonville? No, no. He's a first generation immigrant and he okay. created a coffee company with two other first generation immigrants. So That's obviously awesome. it was like a big conversation we had throughout it and same Everything you just said was like <laughs> okay. exactly the same thing, but no, I love just hearing it um, from you just to continue, like anyone listening, you know, it's just not the life story for everyone. So it's like remembering like all the things that the people do to yeah. get you to where you are today. Yeah. I always say it's a responsibility for me to go out and have that same mentality of like, 
work hard. Well, right now, yeah, do work hard and then work harder. So it's like, <laughs> think about everything that someone's done for you. Yes. Um, so leading into working through the, the high school years, working at the restaurant, you did go to University of North Florida and study Florida. criminology. Yes. Um, tell me a little bit more about making that decision and then your time at Florida. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I went to the University of Florida and it was interesting because I think like most well, most Asian families strongly encourage you to be a doctor, a lawyer, a pharmacist. And thankfully, my parents didn't strongly encourage me to do anything. But but I heard a lot, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a pharmacist. So when I first went into to UF, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I think sometimes you think you need to have it all figured out. So, but I started with pharmacy. I thought, okay, maybe I'll try pharmacy. I took biology and chemistry courses. They kicked my butt, mm -hmm. both of them. Biology specifically, I would have flunked out, but I dropped out before they could flunk me out. But it was a nice, it was a moment to step back and think, well, what am I good at? And I thought back to when I was a kid and I really wanted to be a cop hmm. and I, yeah. And I really wanted to be in the FBI. Those are the two things. Cause I was always so curious about people and loved helping people. So I thought, okay, criminology aligns with that in, in the closest way of all of the degrees that there were at the time. So I went that criminology route that's how I ended up getting into that. That's interesting. And my sister read all the Nancy Drew books, you know, she was, um, <laughs> you know, the, so I was curious though, with the restaurant, working in the restaurant, did you make the kind of the decision early on that that was something you had no interest in or how did your parents, did they want you to not be in the family yeah. business or how did you kind of make that decision of just saying, closing that door saying, Hey, I definitely don't want to be in the restaurant business. Or was that a conversation you kind of had with yourself? Yeah. I think thinking about it, I, I love the restaurant business because I had been doing it for so long too, but my, my parents, my dad specifically, especially later on in my life said that he would disown me if I got into the restaurant business. <laughs> and, and it, typically that's the opposite of what parents might say if they have the restaurant, the family business. But I think he knew how much work and time and maybe a little bit, it got him a little bit out of balance. He never, he never complained though. And so he didn't want that for us, but it's funny now my brother owns two restaurants and, and, and one boba shop in oh. Orlando. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting to see that, that dynamic shift, but yeah, it wasn't a, I don't think there was a, a moment where I said I wasn't getting into it, but I thought, okay, the next step after high school is college. And I would come back every week or every other, sorry, every weekend or every other weekend to help at the restaurant too. So I was still kind of supporting that and enjoying it. It was kind of my element, but I, I didn't, you know, I didn't think too much about it. I just, I worked at the restaurant. I helped and supported in that way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you get your degree in criminology, yeah. right? And so yeah. tell us about kind of that decision about what to do with that next and, and kind of the progression afterwards. Yeah. So I think going back to when I started pharmacy too, and I almost flunked out when I got into criminology, I, I found it to be so natural and, and every, the classes were easier. I understood them more. And I aced, I think I got straight A's for five semester after almost flunking out mm. of, of biology. So it really taught me to think, okay, well that aligns with me. I don't think I thought that at the moment, but looking back that aligned with who I was and my natural talents or gifts, but sometimes we don't take the time to listen to those, those quiet whispers because there's everybody else telling us what to do. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I ended up getting into to criminology. 
and then leading into, um, into life coaching. Mm. Yeah. And so <clears throat> tell us a little bit about what really inspired that, that day though, that you decided, or well, usually decisions like this don't happen in a day, <laughs> but at what point did you start thinking about launching inspired yeah. and then walk us through that process? Cause you know, it was funny when you were talking about, you know, like you go to high school and then you work in the family business and then you go to college, but nobody tells you what to do after that. That's it's true. like, they're going to give you the piece of paper that you earned for the last, you know, 16 years of education. But after yeah. that, boom, you're on your own. So yeah. tell us a little bit about what led you to launching inspired. Yeah. I think first, sometimes, like you mentioned, people think it's like from point A to B. If someone goes from point A to B, it's just this really straight line. But there are so many in in my instance, and I think in many instances, there's so many twists and turns that lead you to the destination. And and I'm still on a journey too, but from from criminology, I got into loss prevention. And loss prevention is catching shoplifters, interviewing them and professional shoplifters. I would find out where they were taking the goods that they stole and find the bigger fish per se. So, but it was hard to get into loss prevention because I had this degree, like you said, and they don't, people don't tell you what to do after your degree. Like, Here's my piece of paper. What do I do with it? And I started looking for jobs in loss prevention. Nobody would give me a job. They closed the door on me. The moment I said, I, the moment they asked, what experience do you have? And I said, I don't have any experience in loss prevention. But so after about 10 times, 12 times of getting my door, getting the door shut, I thought, well, what can I do differently? So I started calling retailers back and saying, Hey, I don't have any experience, but I'm really passionate about loss prevention. And I'll, I will volunteer. If, if you have a position, I will volunteer. I will work for free for you and just to, just to prove that I can, I can do it and show you that I can do it. And I ended up landing a job in loss prevention and loved it. I loved it so much. And I think it was aligned to, to that cop and FBI serving people and being curious about people. Then I got into sales and, and sales was, was super interesting too. I loved it. There were so many elements that were very similar if, if I look back at it. Right. But in retail, when I was working retail loss prevention, I was working about 60 hours uh, a week and in sales, I was working 40 hours. So I was a little bit unbalanced in, in when I was working in retail loss prevention. So when I w worked and started sales, I thought I have these 20 extra hours that I'd never had before. And I literally treated them as gold. I started, I started really focusing and honing in on my self-development. I joined Toastmasters and, and started to go consistently. I joined before then, but I was too scared, first of all, and, and I didn't have the time, but I started to go consistently and our, my manager really supported that because it helps in, in sales too. And so really worked and honed, focused on personal development, pandemic hit, mm. right? 2020, the world shuts down, right? The, the, and and you can't go anywhere. It's just you stuck with your thoughts. And then along with that, there was a lot of chaos going on in the world, right? There was just so much going on and heartbreak. And it just broke my heart to hear, you know, people in isolation, people struggling. So probably for a week, every morning I cried and because I, I just felt that, that, almost sadness that people were, were going through. And I, and Bob was like, are you okay? He's thinking he did something wrong, but, but I felt that sadness each, every morning for like seven days and straight, I'm like, I need to do something. I feel like there's something more that I can give while I loved sales and I love loss prevention. There's something deeper and more meaningful that I needed to serve. 
So with Bob's support, he really encouraged me to, to, to do that, but it was still hard to leave. I was working in sales. I was doing well. I enjoyed it. I was making six figures, but I, but I wasn't truly happy right inside, like my purpose, there was, there was something missing. So I took that step to, that's when I kind of took that step to say, Hey, I'm going to start inspired. And it took me about six to eight months after I started thinking about it to actually leave. It was a sense of security. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes and over the years, when I look back on it, happiness, right? I, I thought I could get happiness from a promotion. I thought I could get happiness from a new car. I thought I could get happiness from making six figures, but how long did that happiness last? It was very fleeting, right? It was super fleeting. So it led me to, that's how it led me to, to life coaching and starting inspired. I wanted to ask and unpack a little bit more about like, the process of, okay, you were in sales, you know, there's monumental event worldwide event happens and you felt kind of this discomfort, uneasiness, confusion, probably a little bit of not knowing how did you process all of that and come to figure out that inspired was going to be, you know, your true purpose. Tell us a little bit about that process and, and how you got to that point. Yeah. I think since we couldn't go out, it was just me and my thoughts. And like I mentioned, and I thought, I I think a lot of times we get so busy being busy. Yes. I was working 60 hours before and I cut down to 20 hours, but I was filling it with other things. When we, when I, when I intentionally or unintentionally, I couldn't go anywhere else. It left me with my thoughts and to reflect on what I truly enjoyed and what I truly loved. And I was doing personal development things throughout those years before that Tony Robbins, he's a big influence for me Mm -hmm. and has helped me help shape me in my journey and also into becoming a life coach and serving people now. But I think I thought back to, so going back even longer than that, 12 years old, I, I started my first self-development book. I, I started reading my first development, self-development book called, um, I, I can't remember what it's called, but it was about how to communicate with people. And it was, um, it was, I was an introvert at that time. And I remember, I don't remember the details about any, any of it, except one point to ask questions and be curious. And that sparked my curiosity for people and then liking to help people. So I thought back, well, what do I, what do I like and what has helped me in the past before? Right. So I read a lot of books and they were, they were super helpful, but they, they also weren't helping me get to all of the results that I wanted. And so, um, when life coaching was in the, got in the picture, then that was, that helped me take action. That helped me consolidate decades into days, right? It can, it helped me utilize others, tools and strategies specifically focused to me. And so I thought, well, I've gained so much from, from life coaching and from, and I enjoy helping people. So that was kind of my thoughts into just doing some deep reflecting and just thinking, well, what truly do I, do I want to do and what will bring me a a sense of purpose? Hmm. And yeah. Oh no, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. And so it was that serving people and helping people that I, that, that came to the core of it. And, and, but I think all of those elements, the loss prevention, the sales, sometimes people think, well, I spent five years doing something that was completely not related, but in most cases they are related, right. And they help build a strong foundation and they help build competence in different areas to make you confident, to help you be confident in what you do in the future. Mm. Cause you're the product at the end of the day. That's what I always say. People figuring it out. I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, you're the product. Like if that job doesn't work out, well, guess what? They trained you for six weeks, how to do sales, rock star. Um, (laughs) 
Because what, what I want to ask next is it being in a people centric business, yeah. right? Like yeah. we are as well. Yes. It's um, one of the hardest things ever, right? To like deliver your product. Cause then at the end of the day, it falls back on them of like, are they going to absorb it? Are they going to apply it? Yes. So what I want to ask you is tell us a little bit more about that journey into the entrepreneur lifestyle, you know, yeah. and having to build your business and just throwing yourself in the fire, especially yeah. in a very people centric business where, you know, your results ultimately you know, and their results, but of course it just falls back on them at the end of the day. So tell us a little bit more about that launching the business and just doing the dirty work to get it going. Yeah. Well, first on the word entrepreneur can have a sense of glamour to it, right? It can, it can seem so, so glamorous, but when I first started, it was so scary. I mean, there's so many details and intricacies, as you know, that they don't give you a book for it, right? You kind of just, you have to figure it out. So anything from setting up the business behind the scenes, accounting to what the message that you want to deliver, what I wanted to deliver was what I could help serve people. And, and like you said, help keep people get results, mm. right? Help keep people see tangible results. That was something that was near and dear to my heart because if people aren't seeing those results, then they don't think they're making progress, right? Even though they might be, but they, a lot of times we need to visually see that progress. So I have a system now, but it took a while to, to do that and, um, and to get the certifications and, and the knowledge to, I, I feel like I, I've always been a lifelong learner. So that's helped like reading self-development psychology books, always curious about people. So those all combined just have helped me do what I do now. But it was a challenge because I think that if you run into hurdles, there's a lot of hurdles being an entrepreneur. And if you don't know that business side or or other sides too, it can try to stop you, right? Like there's a lot of moments. There were a lot of moments where I'm like, is this, is it, you know, I questioned like, is it, is this the right, did I make the right decision? But I think that calling inside me was so much bigger. And, and I think that that's very important too. having a strong why to get you through those moments. And that's what we, we help clients with too, making sure that there's a strong why behind what they, what they do. Right. It's not just, I want to reach a goal. Well, why, why do you want to reach it? And because there are going to be challenges kind of like, kind of like if you're driving, I, I like this example because it's visual, but if you're driving and you're on your way to work and there's a roadblock. What do you do? Do you just stop there and just not go anywhere and say, Hey, well, I guess I can't go to work. Find a new route. Exactly. Exactly. So find a new route. We don't, but there were so many times before this that I didn't start. I didn't find a new route. I thought it was failure. I looked at it as failure as opposed to thinking, okay, maybe this is just a learning. Maybe this is just a way that I can just go another scenic route. And, and so there were moments where I had to almost kind of reflect on what I was doing because I think we can get in a cycle sometimes when, when we get, feel stuck in certain moments, whether it's in the entrepreneurial world, in our relationships, finances, other areas, there's areas where we can get stuck and then create negative energy and, and be in an, a negative energetic state. But where does that go? It, it, it brings our energetic state lower and, and we don't make the decisions we would in a high energetic state. <laughs> So, uh, so it's kind of, it helped me grow so much kind of going through that entrepreneurial process and seeing what entrepreneurs work with day in and day out, it, having that appreciation. I think I, there was a lot of time spent creating it. So the, in the, in the beginning, there was a lot of time sp spent creating it. And now I have a great process. I mean, there's always tweaks. I think you, I'm a lifelong learner too. So I'm always going to be tweaking like, Hey, what can I do better to serve the clients, whether it's processes or strategies or tools. So I'm always thinking like that. But I think the biggest thing is just not 
not letting the hurdles become complete roadblocks where you, where you don't go anywhere, finding a de- finding that detour, finding that detour route, finding a different way to go, the scenic route. And, and yeah, it might take a little bit more time, but it's, I, I think in the end it's, it's fulfilling, right. When we can get past those moments because our mind wants to stay in safety, like, Oh, that's scary. I don't want to go there, mm. but, but in those moments kind of push forward. Mm. Yeah. And no, I love all of that. And I, I'm curious too, to, about the process of getting certified. So like, once you kind of make the decision to become a life coach, I mean, almost like for people that are interested in that, like, where do you even start? I'm guessing there's, yeah. you know, courses and mentors and things like that along the way. Tell us and I'm sure you learned a ton about yourself, even as you're learning about this um, new industry for you, but um, tell us a bit about that process. Yeah. First, I think there's some confusion sometimes around life coaching, what it even is. Right. And especially there's confusion around therapy and life coaching. A lot of times people think, well, is that the same thing? But there is, is one big difference. There's a few differences, but the biggest difference is therapy is focused on the past is focused on the past. Their biggest question is why, why did this happen? Why did that happen with life coaching? We are focused on the present and the future. And our biggest question is how, how can we get you to your goals? How can we get you to where you want to be? How can we help you get unstuck? So as far as the certifications go, uh, there's so many different certifications. Actually with life coaching, you don't have to have a certification, but I felt like I could serve my clients better if I got a little, a certification and I was board certified. So there's a lot of different certifications. I think there's ICF international coaching federation. And, um, I chose to be board certified and, and go a a, a tad different route, but I don't, I don't think there's, there's a wrong choice. There's, there's so many different options. And like I mentioned, you don't need a certification to be a, a life coach, but, um, but it helped me kind of have extra tools to help my clients. I want to ask a follow-up to that question for, because I've never even answered that question for myself. I I just wrote it down to make sure I don't let that slip between the cracks of like therapy is the why in the past and coaching is how in the future. Yeah. And I um, have obviously worked with coaches, but I've also been to therapy. So you've experienced both. Yep. How could someone make that decision? Because I see so many people that kind of like they might struggle with the past, but, yeah. you know, you could usually, I mean, I hate to say it, but like the past is the past. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Can't change it. Yeah. How would someone decipher if like it's a right fit to, you know, if they've never worked with a coach or therapist, Yeah. where do you think someone should start to get help? That's a really great question too. I, I mean, I think, uh, I think with, like you mentioned, therapy is, is focused on that past and kind of like the when you're driving, I have a lot of driving examples Mm -hmm. apparently, but when you're looking out the windshield, right, there's that windshield and then there's that rear view mirror, right? We want to, I mean, it's important to look in that rear view mirror, rear view mirror being therapy, but it's also very important. And the windshield wiper or the windshield is, is bigger than the, there's a reason why the windshield is bigger than the rear view mirror. And, and so I think it's important definitely if somebody has challenges from the past to, to, to spend that time there and, and maybe look into therapy and, and then coaching though, if we want to move closer, I, I work with clients that might do both, right. Or have, have gone through enough therapy and they're like, I just want to start getting to my goals and I want to look more towards my future and, and start closing that gap because I feel, I feel good. And, and so I think it's different for everybody, but just a a lot of times I I think therapy too, there, there might be like a first consultation and with life coaching too, for, for us, we have a free discovery, a complimentary discovery session, and we do virtual and in-person sessions either, or, but I think whether it's us or somebody else, whether it's a life coach or a therapist, I think there's ways to just see if it's a good fit, whether it's like, Hey, can I have a quick chat? I think therapy does first consultations, but if they don't, you could say, Hey, can I have a quick chat just to make sure if it's a good fit? Because they'll ask certain questions that will 
help them understand if it's a good fit for either therapy or life coaching, or if someone comes to me, we'll typically have that first session, fill out a a quick form just to kind of understand what their, what their goals are. And if it's not a good fit, I'll let them know. And if it is a good fit, then I'll let them know too. Well, I think too, with what you just said, and you tell me what you think about this as a, as a coach, um, like essentially with therapy, Cause a lot of people feel like you almost kind of like you lose yourself through whatever traumatic experience you have. Yes. Like therapy almost brings you back to figuring out who you are and who that experience made you into. And then coaching is about identifying the desire of where you want to be yeah. and then getting a game plan to like yes. execute and go make it happen. Exactly. Exactly. I think uh, with, with us, we really help on first creating a strong foundation. I think that goes back to everything that we do because I've learned from working with many clients that that strong foundation is so important. It's kind of like building a foundation to a house. If we don't have a strong foundation to a house, it makes it challenging to weather any storms to build on top of that. So when I say foundation, it could be mindset. It could be, you know, just thoughts, beliefs, and, and sometimes limiting thoughts. So we'll kind of work through that and create that strong foundation and then create a customized roadmap for, for the clients, see where you're at and see, see where exactly you're at and see where exactly you want to go. Because for everybody it's different, right? It's very, very different. But with that, we have a holistic approach, right? Holistic meaning natural, but holistic also meaning whole person, because we believe that every area affects every other area, right? So it's good to look at a big picture to see, Hey, where exactly are you at visually? And where do you want to be? Are there not a judgment thing, an awareness thing, right? An awareness thing. So we can see going back to driving a GPS, Google maps, right? If you're, if you have Google maps and let's say you're taking a trip to New York if you just input the destination, okay, I just want to go to New York city and you don't input where you're at. Is it going to take you to where you want to go? No, no, it's not going to take you to that route. Same, same thing with life. If we don't know exactly where we're at and and we don't know where we want to go, it's hard to hit those goals. Like I said, we might be hitting those goals, some of those goals already and not realizing that. So when we can actually write it down and visualize it and see it, it's so much more powerful. So a lot of times clients come just wanting clarity and goals too, right? Wanting some clarity. I'm really confused. I'm going a million miles an hour or I feel stuck. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, it's interesting talking about baseline. I know like, and you mentioned Tony Robbins earlier in the, uh, I'm not your guru. I remember one of the things he does such a good job of is like breaking down. Like he's like, do you have a mom issue or a dad issue? Mm-hmm. Right. And I think so many things can go back to, yeah. um, and you know, like I know when we, when we hire anybody new, we all have to go through the Enneagram, which is basically just a personality test to kind of see what's the lens through which you look at the world. Like yeah. what are the habits you form? Because like you said, you kind of have to establish that baseline, right. um, which is so important to, to build on. Um, but I was curious too. So you mentioned, so, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, people that come to you or like some of these situations and do you feel like they're kind of more professionally felt like they're stuck or confused? Is it more relationships or can it be just a little bit of everything? I guess, where do you feel are some common um, challenges that you see a lot of people face that you're able to kind of help coach and guide them through? Yeah, it varies, honestly. I mean, I think common things are the goals, feeling stuck. It could be in relationships. It could be in finances. I've seen them all. I, I think seen all areas. Sometimes people, uh, typically clients might come to me for one area and then we might unpack a few other areas right. just to have fun with it. Right. Or, or it just might come up in conversation. So, it, so it might start with when one thing and let's say a client comes to me and goals, goals wise, they want to get better in their finances. But then we ask, well, why? Like, and we unpack that. What's that feeling that they want to create from getting those finances and, and really trying to see is it external or internally focused because from experience too, and, and chasing 
a lot of things, me, me personally chasing a lot of things and thinking that things would bring me happiness. It's important for me to under, help the clients understand and ask the right questions to get them to see what kind of a, a picture of, of why they're, they're getting to their goals, not just getting to their goals. What feeling are they creating or are they wanting by getting to that that goal and is there are there other ways to get to that feeling mm. and what's great about you know they're coming to you it's like they're already coming in with an open mind saying hey i'm stuck i want somebody yeah. to help me so they're kind of coming in with that growth mindset whereas i'm sure you get a lot of people that you know probably aren't ready for it because they maybe feel like you know they're not going to be teachable and coachable and open to some of the things that are going to help them but i feel like people do have to come to that on their own yeah in order to be able to accept that help and you're right. And I think there's a some fear too. I mean, I think because with any change, when, when we're in that stuck cycle, it's easy to stay stuck because it's safety, mm. right? So our mind almost subconsciously says, well, well, we're, we're safe right here where we're at, right? There's no, there's nothing dangerous about this situation, but at the core of it, is it getting us closer to who we really are, want to be and the best version of ourselves too. Mm. Yeah. One thing I want to ask you about is the, with the people that you've worked with and, you know, even just in your own conversations, like, you yeah. know, us and, you know, yeah. like, it's awesome knowing so many people too. Cause it's like, it's so fun to like work with clients, but like, just get such a broad perspective Yeah. in your mind. What do you think is like the biggest limiting belief that you see that people just naturally usually come into these things with? Hmm. I think there's probably two. There's a, there's a fear of failure mm. and there's this perfectionism. I see a lot. And I struggled with it too. <laughs> probably, not, probably both. That's actually. not super surprising. Honestly. <laughs> so, so I think from knowing that and seeing that I've, and, and, and me experiencing it firsthand, those are some limiting beliefs that they might, it might keep us stuck in certain areas, right? Because, okay, I do want to start this business. I do want to have a relationship. I do want finances, but I want to make it sure it's perfect. I want to make sure all the ducks are in a row before I take that leap. And I think that that's so common. And then the fear of failure, like, what if I fail? What if, what are people going to think about me when, if, if I don't do it right. And so that can kind of be a limiting belief that, that any sort of like wrong, different direction is failure. Right. And when we think that, like I mentioned before, I thought I failed in so many instances and I was so hard on myself in, in so many instances, whether it be interviews or getting, you just getting that, that promotion, that, that money chasing the money. And if I didn't get certain things, I would be really hard on myself, but it kept me in this kind of failure, like that mentality. But if I could look at it and just shift it a little bit, right. If I could shift that that thought until uh, to a learning instead of a failure, like, how does that feel? I mean, it just feels different. Mm. Like, Oh, this isn't failing. This is learning. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, uh, talk about analogies, always kind of think of it like a crock pot. A lot of times when we're stuck, it's like our mind is like a crock pot and all we're doing is like stewing all these same things in our mind where yes. it's like, we're not letting anything in anything right. out. It's like, we have to break free of that. <laughs> Um, and I was curious, cause I mean, a big part of what you're doing, like, obviously there's only so much that you can do in a session. So a big part of what you have to do is, is help them incorporate these changes into their daily habits, yes. right. And their, yes. their mindset, yeah. their activity, what they're telling themselves, um, you know, any, any key things that you feel like are a good baseline place for people to start to help develop healthier habits or, you know, whether it's journaling or meditating or, you know, writing things down or, or any little things like that that you feel like are a good baseline to, to start with? Yeah. For people? Yeah. No, I definitely, definitely think journaling is a 
big thing. I mean, if just to kind of, sometimes our thoughts can be really confusing and just to kind of journal it down, but also utilizing it for gratitude. Like that's, that's something that I work with clients on too. And like you said, it, over time, it, it, becomes a habit, right? First change kind of comes with awareness, right? Awareness that, oh, could I be doing something differently? And then that acknowledgement that, okay, maybe I should, I can, I can change, right? And I should change. And, and then it's taking that action though. It's, it's seeing what action that we need to take in order to close that gap a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, I think gratitude uh, mindset is so important. And when we can kind of prime and train our minds to, to focus a little more on the positive, because our mind is trying to keep, just keep us safe. Right. So a lot of times it does look at maybe fo focus more on the negative. Right. But over time we can change that. Mm -hmm. We can definitely change that. I mean, I think there were so many times in my life, especially growing up, kind of feeling, feeling, having those negative thoughts and, and having self doubt and having just self-esteem challenges that, that got in the way. But yeah, I think journaling and, and self-love like you know, at the core of it really was helpful in, in my journey. And, and that's what we work on too, with, with clients kind of gauging where they're at and if we can, you know, get it a little bit higher because self-love, self-worth, that's an area too, that I've found from working with clients is that when we can get that area bigger and higher then every er other area just automatically improves, mm -hmm. just goes along with it. I think one of the, the like misconceptions people have too about like a coach or even a therapist is yeah. um, they either they'll kind of think one of two ways. They either think this person thinks they know everything and they think they're way better than me. So I'm not going to work with them. Mm -hmm. Or they think that the flip side, which is, oh, they already just have everything together and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. But yeah. um, I wanted to ask you, like, I've always had a saying through my time here with Brian at Grit of... Um, I never want anyone to fail. I never want anyone to feel the way I used to feel. And I want everyone to experience the enjoyment of life that I now get to. Oh, I love and like, that. That's like a, my why. So that's great. does that resonate heavily with you too, as well of like the reason you do this for anyone yeah. listening that wants to be a client or is a client, like it's because you know what it's like and you just want to give that back. I mean, it, yeah. it feels good. Like it's really cool to wake up in the morning and think about 10 years ago when you weren't stoked on life. And yes. then now it's like, <laughs> yes. wow, like how cool is it to be happy in the morning and yeah. like living my life? Like, yeah. is, is, I'm assuming that just plays a big part for you. It's so, yeah, it's definitely right on point for me. I think that just being able to do this, do wake up, like you said, every morning and love, absolutely be a nerd and nerd out on what I do because I want to serve them because I struggled with the same things, right? It's kind of the same things, balance, happiness, fulfillment. I struggled with those things and there's hope, right? There's hope. So I want to give the same hope that I received too. And that I got, um, when, when I went through life coaching. So I think that, yeah, I, when I think back about my entire life, there's been moments where I wasn't happy, especially growing up being so insecure and then seeing my family work hard, which was amazing, just that work ethic, but then being a little bit out of balance and seeing, okay, how can I be a little bit more in balance where I'm not exhausted every day and um, I can serve the people who I'm with, I can be present with them and give them the best. But yeah, there's this, like, there's definitely this sense of purpose. It's definitely, I feel it's part of my purpose to do what I do and, and help others. And, and that feels, it's just that feeling that's kind of indescribable. I I'm, I'm so just grateful for, to be able to, to do this and see the seeing clients get results is, is my jam. I used to like skydiving and I thought that was, that gave me that adrenaline rush, but seeing clients get the results gives me even more of an adrenaline rush. No more skydiving for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's being able to see those breakthrough moments. Yes. And, um, that's really cool. And I know a big part of your initiative is just giving back and, you know, big, uh, I know you're big into, um, giving back to mental health and what's been fun to see about mental health is just like, it's cool to talk about, yeah you know, goals and struggles and challenges. I mean, I know growing up, it was like, you know, you would, you know, 
you, you were taught really through society to not express emotions or bury them. And so now it's becoming more popular, which is great. So what do you feel like for you is the message that you want people to know about mental health and, and anything that you're passionate about spreading the word on and, and getting out your passion for it? Yeah, I think since I, there was, I had struggles too with mental health growing up. I mean, I was never, you know, diagnosed or anything like that, but I felt sad. I, I had these moments of, of, um, kind of like challenges. Right. And I think that it's, it can be so fundamental and foundational for, um, us. I, I think I struggled with it. Some family members struggled with it and, and then one out of five, I think people, yeah, one out of five Americans have a mental health condition. And so it's something that I'm really passionate about, but I also am passionate about just like, we are all worth it and you are worth it. And just kind of, kind of having that thought and that self-worth at the foundation of it helped me get better in my mindset. And so I, I'm so passionate about that mental health aspect and giving back to local organizations too. This year we chose Rethreaded and they are an organization um, mm -hmm. that's focused on helping survivors of human trafficking. And, and so, but there's a mental health aspect to that too. You know, when we get back to mindset and how, how they can, uh, how people can get back into um, a thriving, yeah. a thriving state. Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's something that's near and dear to my heart. And I feel like, there isn't as much of a stigma to mental health as there was before. I think it's like more people are starting to, to talk about it a little bit more and be okay with not being okay. But, um, but I think that, I think everybody, majority of people kind of struggle with not feeling enough, whether it's not pretty enough, not making enough money or, um, you know, not strong enough and just enough being enough for, and, and feeling loved. Right. And feeling like, you know, they, they aren't loved. So I, I think really that has helped me put that in, in what I do and help show clients and talk through that with clients on that aspect to, to really create a stronger mindset. And what I want to ask you on, on what you just said there is, you know, where do you draw the line? And to add some context, what I'm saying is, you know, uh, David Goggins, you might be yeah. familiar, of course, right? Yeah. He is a line where it's just, it's about callousing the mind, right? Yeah. And you have to continuously put yourself in that fire. And he even, I mean, he's clearly, um, to me, he's not psychotic, but most people would say so, right? <laughs> so for young people like myself who are like putting themselves in the fire, and then also I've kind of learned it's like, huh, like there's, you know, it's almost like personal developments become this fad where it's also a way of, um, you know, you can almost take it too far. Like yeah. it becomes a yeah. secondary pressure. Like you organize your life, but then you realize, well, now I'm so focused on, did I read today? Did I journal today? Did I network today? Did I build the business today? It's like any day that you're not doing that now becomes a problem. Yeah. Right. So how do you kind of draw the line through this process while people are going through that growth? Almost like you're kind of, um, you're almost mitigating the eventual downfall or like recession in their growth. Do you yeah. get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it, to me, it goes back to self-love too, like creating that strong foundation enough where it, it's not, it's not hitting these goals. If we hit them great and, and having a, a high standard for ourselves, but, but in those moments where we don't hit them and there is just this crazy day that happens and we can't do uh, affirmation or we can't journal or um, we can't write three things that we're grateful for or, or say three things that we're grateful for, giving ourselves grace. I think grace is so important and I've learned to learn that as well. But in those moments where we can be so hard on ourselves because we want the best, I think there is a, a, a a heart at the center of it, who the, the heart that wants to be the best person they can be. But in those moments, when we have that strong foundation and we have that self-love 
inherently that we're inherently worthy, then when we hit those moments that we, we don't necessarily, we don't have the ideal day that we're, we dreamt of, then we can give ourselves grace instead of giving ourselves that negative, um, that negative energy per se. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the, the last question I want to ask is for you personally, how do you protect your own goals and passion and mindset? Anything that you feel like for you personally that you've kind of baked into your routine, mindset, habits, schedule, anything that you do that, that really protects what you know helps you be successful and impact other people? Yeah. There's a few things. I think the gratitude journal is, is big for me and just journaling thoughts if those come up too. But also Bob and I will meditate in the morning and we'll typically read, read a page of self-development, whether it's daily stoic, sometimes a Jesus calling and and we'll read that page to connect with, with us and kind of get grounded and centered. So we'll do that meditation and we'll read and kind of talk about those things. And then at night we'll typically do something, not always, but at night we'll typically do something to kind of connect us back and ground us. And then during the day, if I'll get up once in a while to kind of take a deep breath and just kind of do, do some mindset some thoughts and, and uh, gratitude too, throughout the day. And, and I think that those kind of help in those moments where it does get busy, right? Well, like I think we all get busy in life and we all, it's, it's hard to slow down, but it's also important. Think about crops, right? Like crops, when the first person said, Hey, like we're, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to touch this crop for a little bit. And people thought they were, they were crazy, right? I'm going to let it rest. Now it's a thing, right? You, you, you should let crops rest. And same with our, if we have our phones, right? If we have our phones and we don't charge it, what's going to happen? Die. Yeah. It's, it's not going to have the energy to sustain. So I think it's the same thing with us. We all need to refuel and, and find ways. So whatever that is, it's different for everybody. Yoga. Sometimes I'll do that. You know, uh, there's a body balance or something at the Y. So I'll take, I'll do that. And, and, and that meditation, but it's different for everybody. So finding what fits for you. And then if it gets boring down the road, cause sometimes it might finding another route, right? Not just stopping. Like what else can I do? Can I work out? Can I go for a run? Can I dance? Can I dance in my living room and dance with the kids, dance with friends, <laughs> just have fun with the different ways that we're meeting the, the needs to help center us and get us back to the present moment. Mm. Yeah. I love that last part. Just talking about kind of switching it up, you yeah. know, I mean, like I've yeah. been working out for like four years now and I, I went and did hot yoga the other day for oh, the first nice. time, 10 out of 10. Awesome. Like, oh, loved it. <laughs> By the time I left, I was like, yeah, I see why so many people come in here and, and like, it's so popular. Um, but this has been a ton of fun. I've been over here just like, like so comfortable in my seat too. Like yeah. such a good conversation. You know, we, I mean, we talked a little bit about, you know, your story and stuff, but I, I love that we really leaned into just value for the listener today. So thank you for sharing everything that you did today. Yeah. Um, as you know, the last question we always ask our guests, um, Oh, quick name drop too. If you haven't already, you can go listen to Ely's husband, Bob, Bob Warren. I believe he was episode somewhere in the twenties. Um, definitely go listen to that. So I'm sure as you know, with our great creed, as you saw in Bob's episode, yes. we always wrap up by asking you what part of the great creed resonates most with you and why? Oh, there's so much. <laughs> I will start with that. But two of the things that really stood out to me was I will try, try and try again. Mm. Going back to that roadblock too, right? A lot of times we think that it's the end when something doesn't work, but thinking, okay, what else can I do? How else can I try? I really, really love that. And then the other thing is I am mentally, physically, and emotionally resilient. That's what we help with in, in life coaching too. So I, I really connect with that being balanced and not just looking at one area, but multiple areas. How are we emotionally? How are we physically? So just 
having those phrases, I really thought that those were two key, key phrases. And, and if we can really have them and just kind of analyze and think through those and have those, have those for times when we might be going through a challenge that they will really, really help support us. Mm. Yeah, I love those as well. I know it's hard to pick one, right? It really is. <laughs> I, I asked it before the show and you said, well, pick two. Is that okay? I'm like, sure, yeah, we'll go through the whole thing if you want to. Um, but thank you, Ely, for thank coming on so today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Just in case anyone does want to get in touch with you, talk to you about coaching, yeah. or even just let you know how much they enjoyed the episode, yeah. um, it's e inspired, E-N-S-P-I-R-D dot com. Yes, correct? yes. Great job. Thank you. I kind of read it off the paper. We'll just roll with that. Good job, Rita. <clears throat> so thank you again, Ely. Thank you so much. You guys heard it right there. E N S P I R D inspired.com. If you would like to get in touch with Ely, I know she's also on LinkedIn as well. Ely Liao Warren, you can find her there. That's a wrap here at the grit.org podcast. Be sure to share this with someone you think it would resonate with or impact. Check out our other episodes. As always, we appreciate you tuning in for another episode of the grit.org podcast. 